guys and welcome to episode 238 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now, on this episode, I got back on Kimberly Quinlan. Kimberly has been on the show several times. Kimberly is a licensed marriage and family therapist who treats OCD. And I got her on because I wanted to talk to her about sex and OCD because I know this is a topic that she is particularly interested in. Uh, So I wanted to get her on to answer your questions. So through my email list, I asked uh, if any of you had questions around uh, the topic of sex and OCD. I got so many questions. So what I've done is merge some of them together because there was a lot of overlap um, and tried to kind of cover as many as I could. So uh, Kimberly kind of breaks down and answers those questions for you guys. So firstly, thank you for asking them. I really appreciate it. This episode really was built around your questions. So in it, we talk about when OCD impacts your ability to connect with your partner, sexual intrusive thoughts and anxieties impact on sexual expression, why it may be difficult to enjoy sex, working through intrusive thoughts that interfere with sex, avoidance of sexual intercourse because of obsessions, cognitive distortions around sex, the influence of porn, worrying about pregnancy during sex, contamination worries, sexually transmitted disease worries, when sex can be a compulsion, We talk about medication's possible effects on sex, letting go of extra expectations of what sex should be like, how to relate and create a better relationship to sexuality, how partners can help, words of hope, and much, much more. This is a really wide-reaching episode. Now, this topic of sex and OCD is is so broad and so big, it's impossible for us to cover it in one episode and I will do my best to try and cover it again in the future in more detail. But thank you so much to Kim and of course to you guys for listening. Thank you to our podcast partners NoCD. NoCD deliver exposure and response prevention sessions with an OCD trained therapist directly inside the NoCD platform done over face-to-face video conferencing. In the US, no CD except insurance from insurance companies including Cigna, United Healthcare, Regents, Primera Blue Cross, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, among others. They now operate in more states, including Michigan, California, and North Carolina. If you want to find out more, call no CD's intake team. To find out if they currently take your insurance, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. Their in-app tools and community is free and accessible to all, regardless of location. Simply download the app from the App Store. On today's show, I have Kimberly Quinlan. Kimberly is a licensed marriage and family therapist who treats people with OCD and related disorders, eating disorders, and body-focused repetitive disorders. She runs her own podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit and also runs cbtschool.com. Welcome back to the show, Kim. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. And before we get into today's topic, uh, just what's new with you? Anything you want to share? You know, it's been a while since we've spoke on the actual podcast. Right. Um, what's new with me? Well, we're right smack in the middle of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. So that's new with me um, for sure. Um, I am. I think I'm doing pretty well coping with that, um, mainly because I have many, many distractions that have, you know, taking me away from actually really falling into that too deeply. I am uh, maybe 45% through writing my first book on OCD um, and self-compassion, my two like favorite topics in the world. So that's, that is the majority of what's going on with me. (laughs) It is all night and all all day what's on my mind. Yeah, no, that's great uh, about the book. And obviously we did an episode on self-love. Um, which obviously mm. falls within that compassion umbrella. So I'll, I'll link to that. Um, so today uh, I got you on to talk about sex and OCD. Um, and obviously sex, the topic, can be very complex and mean very different things to different people. So uh, we'll, we'll try and go through it um, based mainly on questions I got from the listeners. So well, pretty much all of the questions as questions are from the listeners so hopefully it will reach many of you um yeah i guess so let, let's start off with uh can ocd impact your ability to intimately connect with your partner well i mean first of all as we move through and we talk about this we want to really slow down and recognize that for each person it's going to be different, right? So for every question, we're going to sort of preface it with that. 
Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there is lots of research to show that sexual sexual experiences can be impacted by OCD. Um, either together at the same time or secondary to OCD, the, you know, the playing out. In terms of connection, what I would say is I don't think it's the OCD that pre prevents connection because lots of people who have OCD have rich sex lives and rich intimate relationships. But what can happen is some of the compulsions that are done can very much in, you know intervene and prevent us from having that intimate connection with our partner mm. um, you know especially any kind of mental rumination right that's real a buzz kill for a sexual expression um, so um, very much I would say again I think it's really important that we identify that specific reactions to obsessions is what can really affect how we connect intimately yeah no, thank you. And we're definitely going to unpack that some more in the next questions. So um, a similar question, but slightly different, which is uh, can sexual intrusive thoughts affect libido? Yes. Well, when I, what I will say here is it's not just the thoughts. Any time our fight and flight system right? Our, our, the, where we really, you know, our, where our amygdala is, anything that's detecting danger, anytime that is heightened, there will be an impact on sexual expression, arousal, ability to orgasm. Um, in many areas, it can impact mainly because it's competing with the area of your brain that mm. creates arousal. So if your brain is very much lit up with the fight, flight and freeze, um, you, yeah, the, it's competing with the sexual area. So absolutely, anytime we have any type of anxiety, it can impact that. Specific thoughts, intrusive thoughts, have different effects, right? So, of course, you know, there are people whose obsessions are about sexuality, sexual orientation, pedophilia. Of course, those are going to have a very big impact on somebody's sexual expression and, and engagement. Um, but in addition, you know, I think every different subtype of OCD has its own way of playing it out with contamination. If you're having intrusive thoughts about, you know, getting HIV or getting sick or having germs, that too can impact someone's ability to be aroused, reach orgasm, um, feel pleasure in general. Um, so, and, and we could go on for the whole show, just talking about different obsessions and how yeah. much that can impact. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And good point on the fight or flight. Uh, cause yeah, when you're, when you're anxious, it's hard to feel arguably any other emotion because anxiety is so overwhelming. Um, right. I haven't seen it, that kind of cup metaphor of, you know, if your cup's filled with this anxiety liquid, so to speak, you can't pour any happiness liquid or sexual drive liquid in there because it would just spill out. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Well, and especially with fight or flight, usually we're removing ourselves from a danger, right? That True. When that system gets lit up, we, we feel the need to, again, fight, flight or freeze. Mm -hmm. um, and so in those actions, they're usually actions that push us sort of away from things. So it's really hard to get close to someone when you feel this real big resistance and urge to get away from the situation. Um, so, you know, biologically and physiologically, it makes it very difficult. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, so uh, next question is, uh, is it normal for those with OCD to have an extremely difficult time enjoying sex? So when you're actually in the process of it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and when I answer any of these questions and when I say absolutely, I mean, you know, it's very normal and common for us to have that. It doesn't mean everybody has that experience. But yes, um, when we are intimate with someone, right, or even intimate with ourselves. So I want to also include, you know, self-pleasure there as well. We do need to be connected to our senses, right? Incredibly connected to our senses. In fact, how in connected to your senses often will depend on how aroused and how much enjoyment you get. 
So if you have, you know, a constant, you know, chatter of OCD in your head, or like we just talked about, a massive amount of anxiety in your body, it is very difficult to access sensations and smells and tastes and touch. It, you know, our senses it becomes very, very difficult. Um, the cool thing is the treatment of OCD actually encourages us to practice mm-hmm. mindfulness. And with mindfulness, we can actually return back to those senses. Um, but absolutely, um, as if someone is having intrusive thoughts or, you know, in, in this case, like even intrusive urges, um, they definitely will have a difficult time reaching, you know. Again, what I will say here too, and I'll go off topic for a second is, what we're going to probably be talking a lot about in today is sexual dysfunction regarding struggling to orgasm, struggling with arousal. So it's important that we recognize that while yes, when we're talking about sexual dysfunction, we can have struggles with arousal and orgasm. There is also the struggle with premature ejaculation, which can happen as well. Um, So absolutely. There's a definite correlation there. Yeah. And uh, my next question was actually on about, whether people have difficulty finishing sex, uh, which you've just just said. Um, so, uh, next question is, is it common for people to lose their sex drive altogether when they have experienced OCD cycles focused on taboo sexual thoughts? How would you suggest working through this to maintain as much of a normal relationship as possible? And I guess they mean sexual relationship. Absolutely. Well, like anything, when we have an incredible amount of anxiety or distress around a topic. We do associate it as either good or bad. Mm. Um, you know, that's, I often will share with my clients and patients that when we have a thought and we label it as, as bad, our brain will remember that. And next time you're in that situation, it will retrieve it as a bad threat, right? Mm. So if there is an association, let's say you're having very, you know, like you said, taboo sexual thoughts, thoughts of sodomy and pedophilia, this can create an immense amount of shame, anxiety, guilt, you know, a lot of those really difficult emotions. And we can start to associate sex with negativity, you know, something that's painful, uncomfortable, um, very, very uncertain um, and, and shameful, as we said. So, and that can affect how we relate to sex and intimacy down the track because of that association. Mm. Um, this is also true for um, you know people who have been sexually assaulted, that they can struggle very much with arousal following that because of that association and fear. Um, so when it comes to OCD, um, mentally, if of course, if we're experiencing something as scary and negative, you can experience an associated negativity towards it and in result it can create struggles with arousal Mm. yeah no thank you for that breakdown um yeah okay so next question is have i have i had okay i've had ocd thoughts come up during sex that have felt so real and have scared me uh this has put me off having sex in case it happens again how do you overcome this? So I guess this is really a question around avoidance entirely of sex. Right. Well, now we get into the meat of exposure and response prevention. Mm. Uh, we have been taught this idea of what is right sex and what is wrong sex and what are right thoughts and what are wrong thoughts. Mm. And that can put a very big imprint on us, particularly when we are engaging intimately with our partner or ourselves. Um, if in this case you're having that reaction of aversion to it and you're saying, I hope I don't have it, we can assume you will, right? Mm-hmm. Because we know that thought suppression doesn't work. The more you try not to think something, the more you actually are thinking it because you're trying not to think it. Um, I'm sure you've discussed that on the podcast before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the way here for you to make a massive change is actually to practice having the thoughts during sex, willingly allowing the thought to come and not labeling it as good or bad like society and culture has, mm-hmm. or maybe we even have ourselves, right? 
and allow those thoughts to come in during intimacy. A lot of people go, that is ridiculous. How would I ever allow myself to think about A, B, and C while having sex with somebody I love, right, or somebody I care for? Mm -hmm. But, But here is where we go back to the basis of OCD treatment, which is the content of your thought doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're thinking about something sexual or you're thinking about making corn on the cob. It, it neither are more and better or worse. And the more we can allow ourselves to have thoughts, the better a relationship we have with them. So in terms of treatment, if you are my patient or client, depending on, you know, your values and your religion and your, what you believe, I would absolutely encourage you to have those thoughts during sex and invite them or at the least observe them as they come up and allow them to rise and fall on their own. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of go into it kind of, yeah. Yeah. Cause as you say, here, well, it, av- I say, yeah, avoiding it is, is making it worse arguably. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think it also goes to this idea of there is so much shame around sex in general. Yeah. Don't even put the thoughts in there. Um, most people who are coming into adolescence, young adulthood, have already c- kind of gathered some shame around sex because yeah. of the way our societies um, treat sexual intercourse and intimacy. So already we have so much shame and so much blame and so much guilt associated to what we think, what we feel when we're having sex, what, what feels good and what doesn't. You know, it's it's true for, I think, the whole population in that we are very, very hard on ourselves when it comes to how we perform sexually, mm. not even physically, but in, like mentally, we also expect ourselves not to have intrusive thoughts. And that's not that cool. It's That's pretty hard. It's a difficult thing to expect yourself to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important point because so many people in the world that don't have OCD have hang-ups around sex because of religion or culture or upbringing or um, traumatic events or there's a million factors of why someone... Body you know, image. Body image, yeah, exactly. The list goes on. And so, so yeah, I guess I bring that up just to give some comfort to people that you, you're definitely not alone in this, that it's people without OCD... There's many people that have severe trouble with sex, sexual relations. So, but yeah, obviously, if you have some of those, maybe I, I, the term hang up isn't great, but I use it because my brain's not working and it's late. Uh, <laughs> but the, yeah, the, if you have one of those hang ups and then OCD is going to say, as we've talked before, OCD will sometimes latch on to things that you care about. And, mm. or yeah, so, and also if, I guess if you, value sex and sexual intimacy then it could also latch on to that right absolutely Mm. absolutely um we we have been taught from a very young age how we are supposed to perform um and so for someone who has let's say developed ocd in their teens or early adulthood that can become really problematic because that's when everyone's trying to figure it out and you can imagine if, if everyone's trying to figure it out and you have this mm. other, you know, thought or sensation or urge that keeps coming over you, um, that in and of itself can sort of completely shut us down, right? And, and I think it's important to recognize that if you are shut down, meaning like you're, that's basically you in freeze mode, right? Mm. Which is a very normal response to anxiety, right? Fight, flight, and freeze. So it mightn't be that we're physically frozen. It might be like, again, um, arousal-wise, there's some freeze happening as well, which is a normal part of the nervous system. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, Yeah, there's so much here already, even when you remove OCD. Um, Yeah, I guess a question is coming up for me. This isn't a listener question now. This is kind of one that sparked in my mind. Sometimes how do you, because do, I don't want to get into the content, but how do you distinguish between when someone does need to work through maybe some negative beliefs or distortions around sex and intimacy, you know, 
because and distinguishing that from actually this is an OCD thing, you know. Same as like um, when I think about relationship OCD, uh, I guess the reason I bring this up in terms of like, you know, let's the film industry, the way in romantic comedies they portray love, it's it's so it's it's entertaining don't be wrong i love those films but it's not <laughs> it's not helpful you know no, um no. it's not a true accurate representation of what love is uh in my oh. opinion um and same as like if you look at sex in the city the tv show from from like 15 years ago you know i grew up watching that as a teenager i probably shouldn't mm. have but the <laughs> you know that that makes sex look very easy and very like free and very you know there's no often no troubles there uh and not to pinpoint that ep- tv series but it's, it's many of them um yes yeah, so i guess how do you work through some of those distortions potentially that people have built up in their heads not necessarily of their own accord just because that's what society's pushed onto them right no i think it, i think that this component of treatment is so important particularly in the very early stages of treatment which is you know ultimately the treatment for OCD is cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, ERP, exposure and response prevention, is heavy on the behavioral side. Mm -hmm. But we can't disqualify the importance of cognitive restructuring here, looking at our thoughts and looking for errors in thinking. And I 100% agree with you. We have been taught that this is the way it should look, right? And anytime there's a should there's some trouble. Um, In addition to that, it's not even just sex in the city. I think even pornography is incredibly unrealistic. You know, as a teenager, um, you know, that what they're being told is the norm is something they'll never be able to achieve or or probably not being able to achieve. Mm. And so that in and of itself can be a factor that we need to look at is, okay, what what do you believe about sex? How do you think you should perform? What thoughts do you think you should have? What do you think that you should be having experiencing in your body, right? Mm. Specifically in your sexual regions, what have you been told that you should be feeling, right? Um, what does is, is sex in and of itself a good or a bad thing? And if we can look at that and break that down and come to a place that isn't based on fear or shame often that in and of itself can sort of dissolve some of the anxiety we feel around Mm -hmm. sex because there is so much anxiety around sex because of what we've been told right Mm -hmm. it's sort of this funny thing where like let's say if someone says when you're 10 years old i'm going to let you ride a bike you at least get to see other people riding a bike. And so in your mind, you've got a vision of it. But for sex, it's hard to be in that situation. You know it'll, it will probably happen for you one day, but visually there's not a lot of demonstration that is realistic, and that makes it really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. And I don't know how I missed porn off that list, but, yeah, that's a huge <laughs> thing. Uh- <laughs> Oh, it is. It is. And and it's getting worse. I mean, yeah. I'm not against porn at all. You know, I think that all expressions of sexuality is healthy. But just like all media, mm. we've they have to keep turning up the excitement dial. And that's true for pornography as well. So back in the day, I hate to say that I sound like 100 years old when I say it. But back in the day, the equivalent of pornography was a magazine, yeah. um, right? Or a now, VHS. Right, right. With now, you, it's, you know, the variety of misinformation is absolutely there on online. Mm. Whether yeah, that you're... be through... Yeah. Go ahead. No, sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, and the, the categories as well on these porn sites. Not that I've ever visited them, <laughs> but the... <laughs> Uh, they're so diverse and so and I guess I'm thinking about you know back in again back in the day with the magazines or the early VHS porno films that would have been made uh, I believe they probably would have been more like fictional in terms of you kind of know this is acting right and some of it now with the amateur categories there are on these websites and stuff like this it's it's more real so to speak so it's it's harder to 
take it with a pinch of salt now and and it starts to almost feel like a documentary as opposed to a right. yeah fiction right yeah absolutely I, um, I mean to go into this direction and i hope you're comfortable to keep yeah, going go in it. this direction um there are so many types of fetishes too mm -hmm. um when it comes to sexuality and you know i've talked to so many sex therapists i i mean i if I didn't treat OCD, I would want to become a sex therapist. I find it incredibly fascinating. But there are also fetishes that if you have a lot of shame, you can you may have some intrusive thoughts about. But the, mm. one of the positive things about us sort of having a better exposure to pornography or just sex therapists or, you know, books that are helpful around this is um, p particularly there are fetishes in different sections that OCD can attack, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's important to recognize that's not something we talk about a lot, um, but it's it's sort of, I think the less we talk about it, the more shame people have. So I just bring that up for that reason. Well, exactly, yeah, I, I agree. And generally, like, this isn't a, an episode on addiction, but, you know, many people can be addicted to porn. Uh, and mm -hmm. yeah, the, that, the fact that people don't talk about porn or any porn habits kind of keeps people feeling locked in shame and thus the addiction kind of continues because it's hard to get help if you can't talk about right. it um, yeah. yeah yeah for someone with OCD I've had mm. multiple clients who've come and went through addiction therapy um, and treatment for pornography only to realize that their use of pornography was a form of reassurance mm. right um, so I'm glad you bring that up. Um, in many of the subtypes of OCD, when you, ha let's say you have a thought about pedophilia or a thought about a um, family member that is sexual, we have a lot of evidence and a lot of people's experience to show that it's not uncommon, even though you hate that thought, that you can be aroused by it, mm. Right you will notice some sensations that down there, um, you, you know, tingling and so forth. And that can be very, very alarming. When you have that, sometimes the, the compulsion would be complete avoidance of sex and complete avoidance of the thing that you had the thought about. Some other people have the compulsion of reassurance where they check to see if they are or are not aroused by a certain thing mm -hmm. or a certain topic, a certain, you know, person and so in that way some people have been misdiagnosed with sexual addiction when really they were using it as a, as a compulsive reassurance yeah yeah no that thank you that I, I mean that was an important thing to say um okay so uh let's um go back to the listener questions um uh, so the next one is how do you handle a worry about pregnancy even though precautions are taken i.e. OCD takes off about the possibility which causes extreme anxiety for the rest of the month until I'm sure I'm not pregnant. Uh, this is not a situation where an exposure I in ERP would be possible. This is, this is what... Right. It's a, it's a so, great question. Yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead. I was, yeah. I think... <laughs> you and I, <laughs> go for it. Go you for and it. I really want to... You... The thing to remember here is, again, I'll say it again. The content of our obsessions mm -hmm. um, are no different, right? And we treat them all very much the same. So in this case, if the obsession is what if I'm pregnant, even if there has no, been no intercourse or there has been, you know, like they said, precautions taken, the work is going to be around being uncertain. Mm. That's always the work of OCD is you know, I often explain OCD, it's like one of those mazes on the back of a cereal box, right? Um, if you're trying to find certainty, you'll always hit a dead end on the maze. But if you follow uncertainty, you will come to the out the other side. And it's important that you always listen and follow uncertainty because that's the way we have to, that's the way it is when it comes mm -hmm. to OCD treatment. So in terms of how to manage the fear, it will be radically accepting that it is uncertain and doing your best not to engage in certainty seeking behaviors. Um, does that mean it's going to be easy? Absolutely not. But um, with practice and with 
again, sort of that association with, yes, I can be uncertain and I can still engage in intimacy along the way, um, you can actually have a really quite, you know, great sex life or a great, you know, sexual expression. Hmm. Yeah. No, thank you. That, yeah, that's an important one. I'm glad you said about the content. Um, yeah, because this could have been any intrusive thought replaced yeah. with getting pregnant. Um, but that's definitely, that is definitely an intrusive thought I've heard several times. So this next one was, it was, it was a longer question, but I've kind of removed some stuff um, for anonymity. Uh, so this says, uh, society tends to tell you that if your sex life isn't great or you don't want to jump on your partner all the time, then you're, the, you're with the wrong person, which is a massive trigger for me. Uh, so you can tell this person has a relationship OCD. Mm-hmm. Uh, what mm-hmm. might you suggest to help work through this? Right. You know, it's it's really such a difficult thing when it comes to relationship OCD, mainly because we're trying to access a feeling of love or purity of love or the right amount of love. And there is no quantitative, quantitative way to get there mm-hmm. um, because there is no quantitative thing that you can measure here and so absolutely people with relationship obsessions struggle so much with this sort of idea of you know is it the right kind of arousal is it the right kind of love um is that what the question was around the right what was the particular uh, we was it, kind of paraphrasing of if i don't want to like have sex with my partner all the time surely that means i shouldn't be with them right right yeah. Well, again, this is all about the lack of ed- education that we're given. We, if this is from a female, we have tons of evidence that depending on where you are in your cycle, menstrual cycle, mm-hmm. it will depend on how much testosterone and estrogen and progesterone you have. And those hormones in and of themselves can impact you, how aroused you are or how intimate you're wanting to be. So, but we don't get taught that, you know, often people don't understand those phases of the menstrual cycle until they're trying to have a baby Mm -hmm. and then they, their, their doctor or OBGYN explains that, but absolutely for female specifically, there are stages in the menstrual cycle where you will feel very much zero desire to have sex. Um, for men, it's also very much related to that it can be hormonal. It's often for men also very much related to stress. Men have a very strong um, stress reaction with arousal. If they're very stressed, it does usually turn down that arousal volume. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, anxiety for anybody is a buzzkill, as I said <laughs> at the beginning. Um, so there are so many factors here that can impact it. Not alone, not um, mentioning just connection, right? Con- communication. You know, there, some. I always laugh. My husband and I laugh at people, at, not at people, at the idea of people who have a fight and then have sex. Mm. Like this blows my mind. Like, because I could never do that. You know what I mean? That doesn't make any sense to me. But that just shows how different all human beings are, right? I need to be really connected, right, to feel like I want to move in that direction. Some people can have a massive fight and it's the best time of their life. So that just shows that all humans and all people are different and there's no right way to do it. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you for that example. Uh, Yeah, good question. So next one is... um, there, there was a couple of questions around contamination that came up. So I'll kind of merge them uh, and maybe answer it and answer it from any kind of experience you have with clients. With So one was around kind of literally like, you know, bed sheets being dirty or at least perceived to be dirty or, and I guess anyone with contamination OCD could potentially, you know, because we could say, well, do it on the couch, you know, but then the couch is, mm-hmm. is dirty too or whatever it is. So, so there's, there's that kind of contamination. Then the other one was around kind of like fears around STDs and stuff. Um, yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll open it up. Just in terms of what, what give me more direction and what you're wanting, what they're asking. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's break down into two separate things. So the first uh, contamination sure. example is um, 
generally like the, the the bed sheets are dirty or contaminated and maybe i would assume other areas of the home are dirty so there's no kind of like replacement of like you if a bed's dirty do it on the sofa if you can't do it on the sofa so yeah how would you kind of work with that one right well any time that we're treating um sort of how ocd affects sexuality it's helpful to bring the partner in and have them at least understand what's happening um the other reason why that's really important is we can look at how much the partner is accommodating compulsions. There are three major pieces that impact sexual expression for people with OCD, one of them being accommodation. In fact, that's the biggest one. Um, because when a partner has to accommodate someone's OCD, there tends to be some conflict that arises and that can impact very much somebody's experience and connection. If it, when it comes to contamination, we always want to expose them to their fear, but that can be done in a hierarchical way. So, of course, we're going to start with, you know, making the bed a little bit dirty and then making it a little bit more dirty. And maybe there are certain areas of the house that are harder and easier. And we want to work our way up because the goal here is to be able to have any kind of intimacy in the same way you would if you didn't have OCD. So, you know, an easy, a good question to ask is if OCD wasn't impacting you, how would you express yourself? What What's your comfort level? I'm not going to tell everyone they have to go and, you know, do it in the disgusting bathrooms just for the sake of exposures. I'm going to check in with you and say, if we pulled away your compulsions and obsessions, where is your safe and sweet spot, you know, sexually? Because it's different. Again, talking about relationship, I see it's different for every single person. So once we get an idea of what you're comfortable with, we're going to work towards it, right, yeah. through exposure. But in addition to exposure, a lot of this is going to be sort of supplemented with acceptance and commitment therapy, which is I have this goal and these values what do I need to accept and commit to in order to get there? And often that will involve, you know, it, it's hard because it's such, a lot of people have such embarrassment about it, but it will involve, you know, touching yourself and touching it to an eye area of the house and being able to mm -hmm. tolerate that on discomfort or, um, you know, sitting on a couch with short shorts is sometimes even uncomfortable for people and then working your way up to having no shorts on. These are practical exposures you can use to sort of get you to where you want to be. Hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and then the, the next one, because uh, I, I want to ask a, a question around STDs, but I thought I should have really uh, sandwiched it in with the question... And I'm losing it around pregnancy. So let's say, oh. assume someone is having having sex and they are taking precautions, uh, whether that's condoms or or whether they've both had a both romantic partners have had um, like an STD checkup and they're they're both clear and they've committed to one another. So there's no chance of catching STDs anywhere else. Um, yeah. Is that just the same kind of advice you gave around the pregnancy one? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because many people these days do get sexual, you know, HIV tests or STD tests. These are this is something that is becoming more of the norm, right? In I think some people may perceive that as a compulsion. I do not. I think that when it becomes compulsive is when you need to do it multiple times and you need to do it repetitively again mm -hmm. to remove uncertainty, right? Um, you know, OCD has this great way, or I should say terrible way of even when you have certainty, all it has to say is, are you sure? And then you're back to being uncertain again. So in this case, yes, the same situation, it's going to be around accepting uncertainty, but it also involves checking in. Are you someone who would feel good about having an STD check? Some people say, no, I don't need that. I'm, I know I'm using protection. I'm okay. Other people want that, and that's what they would use whether they had fear or not. Um, so I think that's more about just finding your own yeah. where you are on the spectrum. 
Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I believe you answered this or, or added it into one of your comments earlier, which was, uh, do people use sex as a compulsion to re- reduce their anxiety? Yeah. Um, okay. Number one, uh, we have a lot of research to show generally that men actually have way less stress when they do have some kind of ejaculation or, or orgasm. Um, men tend to be very grounded by orgasm. So that's one level that isn't related to OCD, but I want to normalize that, right? Because, you know, that may be the truth for everybody. Um, yes, there is a degree in which people do use sex as a reassurance-seeking compulsion. Um, as I said before, checking to see whether they are aroused or not by a certain, you know, I had sex, was I aroused? Okay, phew, I'm not, you know, I'm of the sexual orientation that I, I want to be. Mm-hmm. Or I did I have sex? Did I have that thought? Okay, phew, it doesn't mean I'm a pedophile. So, yes, people are using sex in and of itself as an exposure, but they're also using sex as a platform to check whether or not their fear could come true. Um, often people will engage in compulsive sex, again, sometimes specifically with relationship OCD, to be sure that everything's going to be okay, right? Mm -hmm. Because, again, we've been trained to think that, you know, if you have sex this amount of times per week, you're in a good relationship. And so in relationship OCD, very much that can play out. You know, they're checking to make sure they've had enough and does that reach the criteria of, quote unquote is enough so absolutely and then the last piece here I would make sure we bring up is performance anxiety there is a cycle that happens so if you have are having some kind of intimacy with someone and you let's say lose arousal um, what often happens is then you go into a rumination and an anticipatory anxiety that it'll happen again the problem with that is the more you anticipate anxiety, the more likely you're probably going to have anxiety, right? Because you're trying not to have anxiety. And so sometimes that antis- that performance anxiety when it comes to sex can be a whole secondary problem that's related to anxiety. And then people can compulsively have sex to prove to themselves that they're not someone who loses erections or loses arousal so there's many ways in which yeah. it can be used compulsively yeah no that's fascinating um yeah stuff i was going to share on that but i'll keep that to myself uh so <laughs> uh, uh, uh so the next question and it's, actually, it's a comment actually before the question that kind of links to the bit you said around men can find it stress relieving so, so this person says i've noticed that sex can be a good distraction from my obsessions perhaps even a way of grounding myself uh and i can absolutely see that for some people kind of the 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 mindful getting in touch with the body it, with the senses for some people could probably be quite grounding um but then this this guy goes on to say or this person uh however some anxiety depression medications decrease or can decrease your overall sex drive as a male it can be difficult maintaining an erection and or achieving orgasm due to these medications what do you recommend right well this is a really important topic and is one that always comes up when it when it comes to um, looking at our own sexual experience, we're always going to look at what medications, not even just psychotropic medications, but all medications, right? Mm. Um, Number one, the first thing I would encourage you to do is go speak with your doctor. Um, There, this is where it becomes, uh, you know, a conversation of pros and cons. If you're, there's the thing to remember here is there are side effects to medication and there are effects to medication. Um, there is actually a side effect of not taking medication and an effect of, take, of not taking medication. So all of those four need to be looked at. Um, number one, always speak with your doctor and weigh up the pros and cons. Is the benefit of the medication outweighing the, the side effects ultimately? Mm-hmm. And that's something, again, I'm not a medical professional. That's something that you would discuss with your medical professional. But let's say you 
do really well on a medication for your mental illness and the, the side effect is sexual you know, arousal struggles and whatnot, um, and you may decide that you want to stay on the medication, there is still ways in which you can engage really um, intentionally and beautifully in sexual experiences. And a lot of that, like you said, is by going back and engaging in those senses, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, you know, I've, again, I've said, I've spoken to many sex therapists about this, and they keep stressing, like, just keep going back to touch and taste and smell. And it might be even sen certain sensations that go along with that that can help bring on pleasure. The, the thing that's really difficult with this is we've been kind of exposed to this idea that you should be aroused and then you should have sex and then you should ejaculate or have an orgasm hmm. and then you're good to go, right? Like that, and it should happen in that order and that's the way it should be. But some people have very rich sex lives without it being in that order or without it even being completed because they're finding pleasure in other ways and it's about giving and receiving instead of it being about just arousal, orgasm, ejaculation. Yeah. So there are many ways in which you can still have a very rich sex life. Um, while on medication. And if that if that's a struggle for you, I encourage you to reach out to a certified sex therapist because they are amazing at working with this kind of stuff. Mm. Awesome. No, thank you for that. Uh, and, and the next question is very similar, but I'll ask it just in case it triggers anything else for you. So um, it says, I know you're not a medical doctor, but OCD meds have really taken away from my libido for many years. Uh, can you speak to how common this is uh, and how you would approach this with a client. Right. So very similar to the last answer is absolutely it's very common, right? But I'm not going to say that in a way that discourages people from taking medication. Everybody has a different reaction. Hmm. Um, and again, the cool thing is, is that if you've got a really good doctor, they can tweak things to sort of have it be at a level that is comfortable for you. Yeah. Um, a huge piece, there is a component of um, sexual, let's sort of say it's arousal, which is what we call sensate focus. Sensate focus is a practice of engaging in petting and pleasure seeking with the goal not being any kind of orgasm. It's just about, you know, it's being very, just very in the moment with the person you're with. There should be no, in fact, most sex therapists will give you homework to go home and do this with your partner and say, you are not allowed to have intercourse. You are not allowed to orgasm. I want it to be a, like a strengthening of a muscle where you practice sort of like meditation, being able to bring yourself into being very intimate and one with the person mm. so that sen sensate focus you could do some you know i encourage your listeners to just do a google search on that there's tons of stuff out there sensate focus is a really great way of sort of strengthening that muscle up again and uh sensate is that s-e-n-s-a-t-e -E? and yeah s-e-n-s-a-t-e -E, yes cool sensate for then focus yeah. Cool. Um, okay. No, thank you for that. That was, that was interesting. Uh, so next, uh, two more listener questions. So uh, I would like to hear advice about how to uh, how to relate to sex and sexuality after being afraid of it for so long. I want to be able to enjoy sex again, but I feel like there are too many scary thoughts and too big expe expectations waiting in my head. Uh, and they can ruin it for me. So this was right. the, the the precursor to the, this part of the question was that they'd struggled with OCD for many, many years and it affected their sex life. So it's about how can they relate to sex and sexuality now? Um, right. Yeah. Well, anytime we're looking at rebuilding, we, we're always going to start really small, right? And it, And I think a lot of this is going to be around a lot of, normalizing and validating first, right? Um, because I, I totally feel for this listener, 
um, you know, it, the world of sex can feel so scary, you know, for everybody, but particularly if OCD has sort of attacked it in that area. So it's a matter of building small, very respectful steps. Um, how might you do that? Number one, I'm always going to encourage people to go and if you have the resources to see a sex therapist, because they're going to normalize so much of what you're going through and have really a, a practical you know, steps towards it. If that's not an option, I really think there are some great literature books out there that can help first just take off all the shame and the association, which I think is the word you use, mm -hmm. take that association and break it down into looking at sex just like any other body function, right? You know, you eat, then you are full, and then you get hungry again. And we are just like, oh, that's no problem. That's just the way that it is. But yet with sex, we have all this, you know, expectation and shame and whatnot around. So um, a book I really encourage every single human being to read is a book called come as you are um, it's by emily nagowski i love her um, she is a, a researcher in um, all things sex and she talks a lot about just understanding your own physiology and and seeing that it, for me that was a, so important um, and so important for my patients and clients just for them to go oh this is just another thing the body does. It's not, it's not like a song and dance that I have to do on stage. This is just something my body does. So I think that book 100% is important. Um, and then the last thing I think is if you can find a community of people who do not shame sex, a community that sees sex as a positive or a neutral thing at the least, yeah. um, because you know, if you can find a really good friend who can normalize this stuff and you can share with them, um, which is hard. I'm not going to pretend like that's easy. But people are out there willing to share. You and I are one of them. And I, I think a lot of people are more likely to share. So if you can find a group of people that make it safe, that is really important too. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um Okay, so the next question, which I, uh, the final listener question, and this is kind of me merged several questions into one, which is uh, how can the, the partner of someone with OCD help and support them through this process of sex? Um, be patient. Hmm. Be very patient with them, but also very supportive. What we know is relationships where one person has OCD those relationships that do really well in intimacy are the ones that communicate really well, right? Um, they express a lot of empathy for what they're going through. But the thing I found really interesting is they're really hopeful too. They, they have hope in their partner. They believe in their partner that we will get there, right? And so, you know, I, I always encourage partners to seek out your own therapy if that's an option um, because by, you know, if you can keep your hope up and your ability to stay very compassionate with that person, the connection, the, the emotional connection will be there and the emotional connection is crucial for there to be that sexual connection. Yeah. Not for everybody, but for most people in, in, you know, relationship, intimate relationships. So um, absolutely just support them. If you can, you know, make sure you're discussing and uh, discussing ahead of sex. Try not to discuss struggles during sex because that usually, again, is a buzzkill. <laughs> um, have the conversations, you know, make lots of space. Make some time each week to talk about you know, what was good for you, what didn't work for you, what fears showed up, how mm. can I support you? Maybe you might encourage the person, okay, that's a subject I would like you to speak with your therapist about. I'm not skilled to help you with that. But just keeping that communication is essential. Yeah. No, I love that. Thank you. Um, and then a uh, very different question. You've got a billboard in LA. What do you want written on that billboard? Related to sex? No, well, it can be, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. 
Um, well, in LA, it's easy. Everybody's yeah. having sex in LA. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not true. Um, that's very general. Um, related to sex, I would say sex is a healthy, natural, normal thing. And I emphasize healthy, mm. right? I really do. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed um, my own training in this area because it sort of helped me to see the many layers and the many influences that sort of trained me to think that it was not healthy Mm. um so i would just i would write in big bold letters sex is healthy and natural and you know is nothing you should be ashamed of yeah well none of us would be here without it Uh, (laughs) so um yeah, I guess lastly, just anything else that uh, you wish you could have said that I haven't asked you today? Um, I, I mean, the main thing I would say here is this is not uh, a fixed game. It, it's you can you can play this one and improve and grow and have a really healthy sex life. Mm. I, I really believe that and I've seen it in my own practice that you can go from being someone who is completely tormented during sex or around sex or even at the thought of sex to having a very healthy sex life. It's absolutely possible. Um, So that's the main thing I would really want people to know. No one is a write-off when it comes to sex, right? Mm. I, I think when we get really hopeless around not being able to orgasm, not being able to get aroused, you know, maybe sex is painful. We get really hopeless and we're like, I just suck at this. I'm terrible. I'll never, I'll never be good at this. Mm. And I don't believe that at all. I think that um, through experimentation and respectful exchange, I think that everyone can grow to have a sexy, uh, sorry, a, <laughs> sexy, a healthy sex life. A healthy, sexy sex life. Uh, I was going to say a a sexy health, but I meant to say a healthy sex life. (laughs) Excellent. No, it's a great way to end. And uh, yeah, good good words, I hope, for for people listening. Um, Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on again today and talking about this topic that I probably should have covered 150 episodes ago. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I hope that um, it was a conversation that maybe helped somebody feel a little less alone. So there you have it. Thank you so much to Kim for answering all your questions, to you guys for asking them, and of course to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And don't forget today's episode is sponsored by NoCD. To find out more about NoCD and their therapy plans, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash COCD stories or visit the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.